Thank you, Alex. And thanks also, Helena, for the invitation. Uh, I'm very happy to be here in Ingelheim. Very beautiful and peaceful place. And it's really nice that we have a Young Research Leaders Group workshop. And we discuss lots of things on magnets and spintronic systems, like spins, orbits, charges, and heat, and a lot of everything on magnets. <laughs> but in this talk, I'm going to talk about um, orbits. So my, my research area is called orbitronics. And maybe some of you or a lot of you might not be familiar with what this is about. So I'm going to tell you. Don't worry. And this is a new research field in which we are exploring the idea of explore, uh, using the orbital degree of freedom of electron for new types of transport effects. And this is not only just new, but also it has very close relationship with other neighboring fields, such as spintronics or superconductivity. So, so why do we consider orbitals? Why they are important? It's simply because orbitals are basic building blocks of any chemicals and solid systems. So, so orbitals are essentially like Lego bricks shown here. But our Lego bricks are uh, quantum mechanical building blocks, which are a quantum mechanical solution of atoms. So, so depending on how we combine these, we can get all different kinds of exotic materials, also boring materials. And so whenever you are looking at a new material, a good starting point is always to consider how electrons occupy different orbitals for spin up and down. Because uh, this orbital configuration or occupation essentially determines most of the material properties, not only ground state properties, stability, magnetic moments, but also excited state properties, responses, and transport. Uh, but I'd like to emphasize that this is not really a new idea at all. This is very well-known way of analyzing materials, especially in the field of chemistry and condensed matter physics. But we can ask a question that goes one step further. That is, uh, can we control the orbital wave function in non equilibrium? So if you think of a uh, building block of Lego bricks as very static object, it's hard to imagine that how can we manipulate orbitals. But we have to remember that our uh, building blocks are quantum mechanical objects. So you can think of uh, inducing different sort of uh, hybridizations in non equilibrium, non equilibrium situations. And this is the very fundamental idea behind the field of orbitronics. So uh, the orbitronics is really a new field. And maybe uh, I may define the field as an emerging field of electronics that exploits generally the orbital degree of freedom as an information carrier. So what does it mean? It means we are considering different orbital characters of block wave function of electrons. So electron, electronic wave functions, in, fundamentally, they have two different degrees of freedom. One is spin, which we exploit a lot in the field of spintronics. And the other very important one, which has been largely overlooked, is the orbital degree of freedom. So you, have, you can write down your electronic block wave function, and it will have uh, S, S component, PX, or PY, PZ components, et cetera, et cetera. So depending on uh, what type of excitations that, that you can induce in your system, uh, you can think of all sort of orbital excitations, which, carries, uh, which carry not only orbital character, but also angular momentum and its flow. For instance, uh, I'm going to tell you later that uh, for a particular type of excitation, we can induce a very exotic states carrying uh, orbital current, as shown in this animation. The orbital current is one of the most fundamental concepts in the field of orbitronics nowadays. And if you want to know further, uh, you, you may have looked at our recent perspective article. But I'd like to emphasize that this is not really a review article, because uh, we are simply scratching the surface. And probably what we know at this point is simply the tip of an iceberg. So there are lots of things that we still have to discover and understand. But uh, nonetheless, we can still ask a lot of questions. For instance, one major question that we can ask is how to generate and detect the orbital current. So this is really the fundamental thing. We have to be able to generate and detect. The second question is then manipulation of the orbital current by auto parameters, such as magnetization, or superconducting auto parameters, or other auto parameters, or by external perturbations, such as temperature, strain, electric field, magnetic field. And we can also ask uh, a question that is inverse of this. It means, uh, can we manipulate and control the auto parameters by, by the orbital current? 
So this is quite interesting question because that's also where this orbitronics meets with other neighboring fields because it offers a way to control and detect the order parameter. So, so why orbitronics is important? I guess um, in order to see why this is important, we have to think of uh, some, some context in the field of condensed matter physics. So, so what are two major pillars in contemporary condensed matter physics? Uh, I guess everyone has their own opinion, but I think the probably one of the most important concepts is the notion of order and excitation given by uh, Lev Landau a long time ago by spontaneous matter breaking. And the second very important notion that appeared more recently is geometry and topology of, of coarse particles, electrons or magnons or phonons. And the way we study either order and excitation or geometry and topology is by measuring transport and excitations. It's, it's simple because we have to poke our system and we see the response. That's the only way to study these effects. So for, for instance, we, um, we, we study like magnetic properties by transport measurement or by measuring some susceptibilities. Also, to know topology, we can measure different kinds of Hall effects. As you can see here, uh, oitronics is not only a new type of uh, transport phenomena, but also uh, it covers uh, both uh, these two major pillars. For order and excitations, um, I'd like to emphasize that orbitronics, uh, orbital current can be thought of as a new kind of probe to detect and, and manipulate the order parameter. And in this talk, I'm gonna mostly focus on the impact on spintronics, but this idea can be applied to any field which has their own uh, order and excitations. And on the side of geometry and topology, it's also uh, orbital, orbital angular momentum is very important because by its definition, orbital angular momentum is a dissipationless current loop. So this means that orbital angular momentum is an indicator of the geometry and topology. And there are many interesting works. Uh, but if you are interested in, uh, please you can have a look at these papers. They are very, very interesting. Okay. But uh, despite this importance, uh, this field or this idea has been overlooked for a very long time. And the main reason is, as you know, as written in the textbook, orbital angular momentum or orbital degree is quenched in crystals. Because of very strong crystal field, so orbital levels are usually split. So that's why also orbital magnetism is not so important for equilibrium magnetic moments. That is called orbital quenching. Um, but uh, I like to say that um, the orbital quenching is kind of effects that a lot of people talk about, but uh, actually it's not so well defined at the same time that I learned over a couple of years. And, and, and in, this work, um, in this work that we have done in 2018, what we have shown is that uh, we can in fact induce very large or efficiently orbital current by external electric field even, even when there is orbital quenching in the ground state. And surprisingly what we have found is that the interaction that, that is responsible for the orbital quenching, which is crystal field potential, is the one that generates the orbital current. So that's the um, main idea behind this paper. And, and uh, the main uh, starting point was that when there is crystal field, it, uh, it does not simply split the orbital in a very rigid way for PX and PY orbital. They, they depend, the splitting depends on the crystal momentum K. So depending on the band, for instance, for PX orbital, P, P, P orbital systems, the orbital character in K space can have either like radial texture or tangential texture. But please remember that this ground state wave function, for every state, uh, they do not carry any angular momentum because they are simply PX or PY orbitals. They are real functions. It means there is no angular momentum. But uh, one can easily show that when there is an external perturbation, external electric field, we can induce a hybridization between these different textures because uh, crystal momentum is coupled to the orbital texture. Therefore, by shifting momentum K by electric field, you can induce a mixing of 
different orbital textures, and at the end, you can use orbital angular momentum for, for each block state. And, and we have found an intrinsic mechanism for the magnetoelectric coupling mediated by orbital characters, and we have shown that for high symmetry materials, this induced orbital angular momentum uh, is induced along the direction of E cross K. So because this induced momentum depends on K as an alt by alt function, so this actually leads to uh, orbital dependent motion at the end. For instance, these states here with positive KY, they have positive angular momentum and they go into plus Y direction, and, and it is the opposite for states with negative KY. So this results in an effect called orbital Hall effect. So, so when you first think about orbital quenching, the idea of orbital transport is very strange because there is no any orbital angular momentum in the ground state. But uh, what happens in non equilibrium is that by electric field or any other perturbation, you induce orbital angular momentum. And once you induce that, uh, this flows in a dissipation manner, especially for the case of orbital Hall effects. And, and this mechanism is in, independent of the spin orbit coupling. As I told you before, this results from the crystal feed potential that is responsible for the orbital quenching. So orbital quenching is, uh, has both a good and bad side of, for when it comes to orbital. For ground state orbital wave function, it quenches the orbital angular momentum. For, but in non-equilibrium situation, this is the one that actually mediates the generation of the orbital excitations and currents. Yes? No, 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 this is only, only linear response. Here, um, uh, the induced orbital angular momentum is linearly proportional to electric field, and, then, and you have induced orbital angular momentum here and there, and you see that states here, they, they naturally go into y direction, by, even at the ground state. But states here, the nature is that they are moving into minus y direction. So states, that's why they flow in a dissipation manner. So it's not kind of transport uh, by excitation, but this is transport that is already present in this uh, electronic uh, band structure. Yeah. So I'm an order of something to dissipate mass because if you have this quenching, you're going to have the inverse spin, then it can generate some problems. Uh, no. Yes, that, that depends on, uh, on the lifetime here, for instance. Um, if this hybridization can occur within, within the time scale, before any scattering, and this can occur. And, and uh, this is resulting from intrinsic response. So that's why I mentioned it's a dissipation-less manner, in a sense that this also occurs in insulators, for instance. Yeah. For the insulator, how do you uh, apply current? That's a good question. And there are, there, are, there are examples. For instance, in hexagonal molybdenum disulfide, this is called orbital hole insulator. So in, even though it is semiconducting or insulating, there is finite orbital hole conductivity. Yeah. No. no, you don't need spin orbit coupling at all. Yeah. But when there is spin orbit coupling, then uh, spin mo angular momentum couples to orbital angular momentum so spin hole effect naturally follows the orbital hole effect. So in fact, spin hole effect originates from the orbital hole effect. It means that if you want to increase the spin hole effect in your material, you first have to have large orbital hole effect. You cannot have a material which has large spin hole effect, which doesn't have strong orbital hole effect. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I will continue. So uh, once I have done this work, then I started to wonder, can we use this orbital current for spintronic applications? Because orbital current carries angular momentum, like spin current does. So the idea was to find a micro microscopic mechanism to transfer orbital angular momentum to the magnetization. And we found that this can be possible if there is spin-orbit coupling in the ferromagnet. So for instance, if there is spin-orbit coupling in the ferromagnet, a non-equilibrium orbital accumulation in the ferromagnet can result in uh, tilting of the magnetization as shown in this animation. And, and nowadays, uh, this is called 
over that torque, and this offers a new way to control magnetization in complementary to uh, spin transfer torque or spin hole torque. And, and this is actually quite uh, promising in the sense that uh, a conventional way for, for spin orbit torque application heavily relies on, on heavy, heavy elements like platinum. But the problem is, as you know, platinum is quite expensive and there are not so much on Earth. There are other materials like tantalium or tungsten, but, uh, but in, in beta phase, they show very large spin hole effect, but they are highly resistive, meaning that the device operation might not be very energy efficient. But by using orbital current, we have whole different kind of, so many materials, we can even choose from light metals or light elements. So, so we can probably, this will provide a solution so that we can find a material which is energy efficient, but also can, can have large efficiency. And, and this is not only a theoretical concept, especially in the last couple of years, uh, I, we, we heavily focused on showing this in experiments, and, and there are many different ways to detect the orbital torque nowadays. And, but in this talk, I'm gonna mainly focus on our very recent work, and, and I'd like to show that the, the, the orbital torque is actually um, fundamentally very different from the conventional spin hole torque or spin transfer torque. Because when, when you wanna experiment to detect this effect, the key issue is we have to be able to distinguish the, this new effect from the conventional effect. But the problem is the orbital angular momentum, spin angular momentum behave pretty much identically when it comes to symmetric transformation. So they, in principle, they always occur together. So the only way to distinguish is through uh, microscopic details. But microscopic details are very different, qualitatively different, and I'm gonna explain you why. Uh, by the way, how much time I have? Okay, good, I can go further. So uh, the quick question, key question that I like to ask is, how are spin and orbital responses and transports different? And, and the key message here that I like you to all remember is that orbital angular momentum is not, it's not a simple arrow. So for, for spin, we always kind of regard uh, as flow of arrows, that, that works pretty well. Uh, but orbital is not an arrow. Uh, so for, for spin, we can think of spin as an arrow and, and this is actually due to SU2 to SO3 homomorphism that preserve the algebraic structure. And, and, and this is also possible because spin is nearly conserved. It means that this is a property that is already present in the ground state. So, so these arrows are kind of def well defined already in the ground state. And microscopically, spin couples to the magnetization strongly. But for orbital, we have the notion of orbital characters as well as angular momentum. So that's why orbital is not an arrow. And, and it has, especially orbital angular momentum is not conserved. And this is a physical quantity that is not present in the ground state. So you have to induce first to, to define its uh, flow or transport. And microscopically, orbital interacts with the crystal field very strongly. So you see that uh, there are key differences between spin and orbital, and I'm gonna discuss how, how, what are major consequences of these differences, on, especially on experiments. And, and this is actually quite complicated problem for, and, and challenging for theoreticians. And like many other transport effects in, in magnetic system or spin showing system, and these responses are mediated by delocalized and itinerant electrons. And, and they carry both orbital degree and spin degree. And they are not only flowing here and there, they appear here and there. At the same time, they interact with the environment. The environment includes the lattice and the local magnetic moments. They interact via many different interactions. For instance, orbital interacts with the lattice through crystal field potential, and even within a single particle wave function, um, orbital and spin part can exchange angular momentum each other, and spin can also transfer its angular momentum uh, through this exchange interaction. So uh, we were thinking quite a while, for a while, to describe this complicated effect, and we found that one way to, very efficient way to describe 
this complicated fact is by tracking the flow and transfer of angular momentum, not only in space, but also between different degrees of freedom. And this can be done by writing down the continuity equation. For instance, for orbital, uh, with the first term that we see is a orbital flux term, and the second term describe the transfer of angular momentum between the orbital and the crystal, and the last term describes the mutual uh, angular momentum exchange between orbital spin within a single electron. And we can do similar things for spin. We have spin flux, and we have exchange torque, and then finally we have uh, this uh, spin oil term. So this lattice term is responsible for the, the transfer of angular momentum from the lattice to electron or vice versa. And this green term is the one that generates magnetic dynamics that induces the like, switching of the magnetization or the domain of motion. And finally, the last term is the one that is responsible for the conversion of between orbital and spin angular momentum within a single electronic wave function. And uh, we need to think what will happen if we have electric perturbation to our system. And the question is, where does electric field couple here? And it couples to charge, obviously. And, and what carries electric charge is orbital. That's the only possibility. So if you apply electric field, uh, we perturb our orbital wave function. And then what will happen? We have electric perturbed orbital wave function. And finally, then this lone equilibrium orbital wave function can take angular momentum from the lattice. So then we observe angular momentum from the lattice. And then finally, this is transferred to the spin system and then can be transferred to the magnetic moment. So fundamentally, the angular momentum has to come from the lattice. And then what really mediates this transfer of angular momentum from the lattice to electrons to magnetic moments is the orbital. So that's why uh, orbitals are very important, especially for understanding a lot of spin orbital and, and spin orbitronic phenomena in general. And uh, the example that I'm going to show here is, uh, OK, the, the, the result is quite easy to understand. So what we have done is for a bilayer of chromium and cobalt iron in BCC001 stack. And, and we, we look at the orbital and spin accumulations for damping like component that is uh, along the direction of m cross y here when the electric field is along x. And we apply electric field only on chromium layer. And this can be done by projecting our uh, velocity operator in the Kuba formula to the chromium layers like in this form, in a symmetric product form. Uh, but we see also, even, even though the perturbation is here on chromium, we see a lot of responses here in cobalt iron. And this is not, I mean, it's interesting, but not surprising because we have electrons which are delocalized and itinerant. But what, it re what really surprises us is that, okay, for spin, okay, it's not surprising. Again, okay, uh, it's also less than decay. And this effect is known as spin dephasing. And, and this is the length scale over which the angular momentum is transferred to the magnetization. And this is quite well known, and this occurs over a couple of nanometers usually. This is not so long. But what really surprising, surprises us is that for orbital response, uh, it does not oscillate at all. I mean, there are some, some shoulders, but it does not change the sign. But also, this is quite long ranged. Why? Why, why this happens in this way? Uh, if, if you remember the physical picture of orbital torque, I mentioned that injection of orbital angular momentum will couple to spin and it's gonna interact with the magnetization together. But if you think that spin orbit coupling is involved in magnet, then we would naively expect that spin and orbital will oscillate together, but it is not at all like that. So this is really surprising. And, and finally, I'd like to also mention that if you have induced orbital angular momentum, this can eventually interact with the magnetization through the spin orbit interaction. So, so why? Why, why orbital response behaves entirely different, different way from the spin response. So to understand why, I have calculated uh, orbital and spin responses in, for every k points, and what we found is the following. So this is the k space map of induced orbital momentum and spin momentum. And what you see is that for spin momentum, the, distri this, the distribution is quite homogeneous and it's quite, the responses, you can find responses almost many k points, but for orbital, it's very clear that you have 
very strong signal along the kx axis. So you already see the distribution is quite different. And why? why? What is happening? What is so special about kx axis? To understand what is happening, we need to understand the, the energy levels at this kx axis point and orbital structures. So the main point is that um, the, the orbital energy levels are indeed responsive for this very peculiar, a very strong response. And, and there is a degeneracy. And if you have degeneracy, you, once you have orbital excitation, the lifetime can be very, very long. So because the time is a bit short, so I'm going to skip some details. And the main prediction that we have made is that when, when we consider the torque by orbital injection, we expect that the signal will become stronger and stronger if you increase the thickness of the ferromagnet. This is entirely different from the conventional behavior expected from the spin transfer torque. And, and this behavior has been measured by the group of Kazuya Ando in Japan, and they found that torque efficiency increases up to 20 nanometers of nickel in nickel titanium bilayer. So, uh, so the, the conclusion is that uh, so orbital current and orbital torque is very promising for spintronics. And, uh, but still, there are lots of things to discover, especially for the differences between spin and orbital responses. So I'm very happy if you have any ideas and how, how we can combine this new topic with your research field. And I'll also be happy to answer questions if I have time. <laughs>